Isaiah, the ninth chapter, the sixth and seventh verses. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. That's the word of God. Heavenly Father, we come together tonight to rejoice in the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and to share in worship together with our brothers and sisters. We thank you for this great and glorious gift of salvation and our adoption into the family of God. May your word be preached humbly and accurately and received in faith. To you belong all dominion, honor, praise, and glory. Amen. Ah, oh, this is a full house. That's very nice. As we gather here tonight, the shopping's done, the decorating is complete, and the hustle of the season is drawing to a close. Or you're sitting there thinking of the gifts that need wrapping. What time should I put the turkey in? And is it actually possible that a 12-year-old could assemble this toy? Either way, we're here together. You know, it's time for us to, to sit back and kind of take a deep breath and, and just enjoy being before our Lord and with our brother, brothers and sisters, the beloved of us. There's a calm on Christmas Eve, but it has an underlying anticipation about it. I was raised in Colorado, and in the spring and the summer, uh, there would be lightning storms. We lived near a horse ranch, and before a storm... Before the wind picked up or the clouds came over, there was a calm. And during that time, we watched the nearby horses as they began to be excited. They would run around and they kicked their heels up. and They had a sense that something was coming. In this stillness tonight, we sense something greater and more profoundly wonderful than anything we could ever imagine. Our Lord and Savior came into this world and brought us peace, rest, and salvation. And with great expectancy and absolute certainty, we wait for him to come again. In this place of rest and expectancy, I'd like you to consider three things. The magnitude of this event, the unique greatness of the God-man Jesus, and the glory of God's gift. What is the magnitude of this event? It was greater than the creation of the universe itself, this material universe is the stage created by God to display His glory. The God who is eternal and all-powerful, who made billions of galaxies and trillions of stars and planets beyond number, chose our little planet to do what had never been done before and what will not be repeated again. The second person of the triune God stepped into time, the physical universe, as a human baby. Can you imagine those moments before the event, how the entire creation held its breath? Angels and spiritual beings, they didn't know what to expect. Only relatively few humans had heard or read the words of the prophets, and of those, few could imagine what was going to happen. Isaiah told them in Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And as we know, God is with us. Isaiah 53, 1 through 12 says, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And who has the arm of the Lord? He has no form or majesty that we should look at him. No beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. We esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. Micah told them, 
in Micah 5, 2. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephathra, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler of Israel, whose coming forth is told from of old, from ancient days. Zechariah 9, 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And Zechariah 12.10. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps for a firstborn. There are many, many prophecies in the Old Testament about the Messiah. They were given to Israel. Some scholars say that there are more than 300 prophecies concerning Jesus in the Old Testament. And yet Jesus' own disciples couldn't understand what had happened until after Jesus was raised. The life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the nexus of all time, all history, all of the physical and spiritual universe. Everything we know is oriented and measured by this event. Christ is referred to throughout the Bible from Genesis, where God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And it continues on clear to Revelations where Christ says, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. The beginning and the end, all of it. There is no event of this magnitude greater than this. And by God's grace, we've become part of that. What about the uniqueness of Christ, the God-man? Paul describes Jesus in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. He says, have this mind in yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. The Son of the living God became a servant and chose to refer to himself as the Son of Man. This union of God and man, fully God, and fully man, this amazing truth has captivated the hearts of men for centuries. I'd like to share with you a modern English paraphrase of something Bishop Lancelot Andrews, which is a great name, by the way, <laughs> said on Christmas morning, 1606. Throughout Jesus' life, we see him in his divine nature and human nature. At his birth, you see a cradle for a child and a star for the divine son. The shepherds honored the baby boy. The choir of angels celebrated the birth of God's son. In his life, you see him hungry, showing his human nature, and yet still feeding the 5,000, showing his divine abilities. At his death, he dies on a cross like any man, and yet opens up paradise as only the Son of God could do. Why are both of these natures found in one person? Because our nature had sinned, and therefore our humanity should suffer. That's the reason why the Savior was born as a human child. But even though our nature should, our nature could not bear it. It could not bear the weight of God's wrath because of sin. But the Son of God could, and thus he was born a Son of Man. Either nature alone would not serve the divine purpose. They had to be joined, the child of humanity and the Son of God. So one person with two natures, the one who loved us so much that he gave his life for us, the one who was so much a part of us that he retains his human form even now and forever. Look at John 20, 24 through 29. Now Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin, 
was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put your hand here and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. After his resurrection, Jesus was seen by his disciples. He was touched by his disciples. He ate with them. He talked with them. He ascended into heaven, then with a glorified body, and he now sits in the presence of God in his humanity. And he will return in the same way you saw him going to heaven in his humanity. Acts 1, 9, 11 says, And when they had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing up into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood beside them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Even in his glorified body, he keeps the appearance of a servant acting as a mediator between God and man. As certainly as he took up a body, he's keeping it. And to add to his blessings for us, Paul says in Philippians 3, 20 through 21, our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. And how amazing is this? God saves our souls and gives us a glorified body. 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And Paul tells us in Colossians 3, 3 and 4. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Appear with Christ in glory, it's beyond our comprehension now, but it's true. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 through 18 says, For this slight, this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen for the th things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal how marvelous it is that we poor wretched sinners will have the weight of glory and not only to be saved and glorified but to be one with the body of Christ for eternity John says in 17 22 23 the glory that you have given me, I have given them, and that they may be one, even as we are. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and love them even as you loved me. How can we grasp that? That God will love us as much as he loves his son. It's by his power and his sacrifice that we will surely partake of the divine nature. Second Peter 1.3 says, His divine power has granted to, uh, to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from corruption that is in the world because of sin. Jesus Christ is unique, ultimately unique, and ultimate in every sense. He is God's ultimate gift to us. 
And what about that? What's, what is it like? What is this gift giving? Among men, in every society, people desire to give gifts to other people. Generally, they give gifts to people they love. The person receiving the gift has an obligation to receive the gift with gratitude and humility. And the person receiving the gift also feels an obligation to reciprocate the gift. We here in this room, we have that desire to give gifts. We have that obligation to receive them properly. And we have that obligation to reciprocate. If we look at God's ultimate gift, it's much the same. He has a desire to give. From before time, God, our great triune God, in his love, <laughs> desired this gift for us. Jude 1.25 says, To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever, from the Alpha to the Omega. 2 Timothy 1.9 says, God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. In 1 Corinthians 2, 7 through 8, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The purpose of the coming of our Savior is to bring glory to God. And yet in that process, we sinful humans are called and saved and swept up into that glory. The obligation that we feel when we receive the gift, we, we're obliged to receive this gift, the greatest of all gifts, with humility and gratitude. It is our obligation and the obligation of God's creation, all of it, to give him honor, praise, and adoration, and the glory due him solely because he is the holy and divine creator. How much more do we owe him for Christ coming to save us and bring us into his family? What an affront it is to God for anyone to refuse this gift. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded their minds, the minds of the unbelievers, to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The obligation to reciprocate. But what do we have? We're just mere humans. I mean, what can we give God? What will please him? Romans 12, 1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And then 1 Corinthians 6, 20 says, For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. And in Hebrews 13, 15 through 16 says, Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. We have an obligation to God to love him, to obey him, and to give him glory. And when all is said and done, all glory is God's alone. John said, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. All glory came from God, and all glory will return to him. We here are blessed to be part of his great plan and the beneficiaries of his great gift. Praise God. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The glory is God's, not ours. Soli Deo Gloria. Over the ages, believers have written about God's gift and about his glory. In the Book of Common Prayer of the Anglican Church, and I've moved up in time a little, this is 1662 now, and it's not paraphrased, so I have to read this carefully. Glory be to God on high, and in earth peace, goodwill towards men. We praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee, we glorify thee, we give thee thanks. For thy great glory, O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, 
O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. O Lord God, Lamb of, of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Thou that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Thou that takest away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. That thou sittest at the right hand of God, the Father, have mercy on us. For thou only art holy. Thou only art the Lord. Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, are most high in the glory of God and the Father. Amen. In parting tonight, I'd like to read for you one last time for this season. Luke's report of that night, when the Word became flesh, and the wonderful Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, lived among us. From Luke. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was the governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room at the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph, and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. We've looked at the magnitude of the event, uniqueness of the God-man Jesus and the glory of God's great gift to us. And tonight as we return to our homes, we can ponder these things in our hearts and give our gracious God praise and glory for all that we have heard and been told us. May we live in adoration and at the same time in expectation of when we will see him face to face. Heavenly Father, we, the redeemed, meet here tonight as it was planned from before the world began. We give you praise and honor for your great love and your compassion for us. We celebrate and stand in awe of the time when you, the maker of the universe, stepped into time as Christ, as a human baby, the Son of God, the Son of Man. I pray that our gratitude for your sacrifice and everlasting love would never diminish but only grow as your spirit leads us in sanctification. Father, bless your children here tonight and grant them peace, the peace that passes all understanding.